So thank you for coming to our panel for Ask Us Anything, uh, preferably about <laughs> Apple stuff. Uh, if we could keep it in that realm, that'd be good. Um, my name is John Kitzmiller, uh, also known as Kitsy. I work for Fastly, a content delivery network in San Francisco. I'll be hosting the panel today, throwing the catch box around, making sure everyone is able to ask questions. Uh, on our panel today, we have uh, Rich Troughton. Is it SAP or SAP? SAP. SAP. We have Rich Troughton from SAP. Uh, he's going to be answering questions along with Greg Nagel. I pronounced that right, didn't I? Yep. Nagel. All right, I got it. From Walt Disney Animation Studios. Uh, we also have Michelle Delaney here from Lexington, Lexington School District 1. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Nick McSpadden from the Facebook. Uh, if you're in the overflow room watching the stream, we have a Slack channel, uh, PSU Mac 2017 Ask. I'll be watching that channel for questions. So if you have a question from the overflow room, drop it in there. And we'll go with that. So. Uh, Real quick, I would like you guys just to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about your environment so people get some context of where your answers might be coming from, uh, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Should we do an order of introduction? You've got the box. Why All right, start? I got the box. <laughs> uh, Greg Nagel, I work for Disney Animation Studio. We make movies. Um, I'm actually, my, my environment isn't that large. We have under 1,000 Macs. Um, Mac is not the primary platform, but unlike a lot of, which is probably, Similar for a lot of you that Mac is not your primary, primary platform, but our primary platform is Linux. So we have a, a, a very different set of, of, of issues dealing with that. Uh, Windows is this tiny, tiny minority of machines where, where I work, and we'd like to keep it that way as long as possible. That's, that's our goal. Let me try and not drop everything that I'm holding. Um, my name is Michelle Delaney. I work for Lexington County School District 1. Our environment is about 25,000 Apple mobile devices. We've got 3,000 DEP enrolled Macs and 22,500 uh, DEP enrolled iPads. So we've got a pretty big environment. I'm kind of the opposite of Disney. So we've got a very large section that outnumbers our Windows environment by quite a bit. And we're using to, to manage all those devices. AirWatch. Okay. And Greg, I think we can assume we're using you're using Monkey yeah. to manage your devices. Is that a <laughs> safe assumption? As far as you know. As far as I know. All right. <laughs> we'll go with that. Hi, I'm Nick. I work for Facebook. We host pictures of dogs and babies <laughs> and dog babies. Um, I think they're called puppies these days. Close enough. And uh, we have a large number of Macs, a very large number of Macs. We outnumber the Macs outnumber the Windows machines by about four to one ratio. Um, and uh, we, we use Chef, Config Management, and Monkey, and a number of other tools to manage our Macs. We generally use primarily open source stuff rather than vendor tools. Uh, my name is Rich Troughton. Um, I work for a small boutique software firm called SAP. <laughs> And we have about uh, 12,000 Macs supporting our software developers, uh, finance folks, just about everybody you can think of at SAP. Um, we're very big on promoting platform choice. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, different people using it within our shop, and we're trying to provide the best Mac experience we can. Oh, we also support them using Jeff Pro. All right, so who has a question? Really, you all came to a panel. <laughs> Thank you all. Great panel, guys. Don't ask us anything, and nobody has a question. Come on. All right, all right. Let's start here. Hi, guys. Um, I'll start you off. How are you all dealing with APNS in your respective organizations? Because I would imagine you all have varying levels of security requirements. Dealing with what again? APNS. APNS oh, traffic. APNS. That's Apple's push Apple's notification yes, service. Thank you. Rich. <laughs> um, we're dealing with it by, uh, we, our network topology is complicated. Um, I'll just say that. Uh, and Apple push notification services work kind of unevenly. So one thing we are doing currently is we are moving our Jamf Pro infrastructure um, out to Amazon Web Services. So that, among other things, we are able to talk to uh, push notification services, at least from the, the server end, uh, without problems. 
We manage uh, around 40,000 mobile devices with mobile iron, and obviously that relies on Apple push notification service when managing iOS devices. Um, and uh, we don't have any particular restrictions or anything fancy about that, so it generally tends to work. Uh, we do have to do some careful stuff with you know caching servers and things like that because uh, we want to make sure that clients that are on different subnets get directed to the correct caching server for making sure that we don't have overloads of stuff. A lot of stuff is served on-prem. Um, all of our enterprise iOS apps are pushed out from on-premises, not the cloud. Um, we're probably going to change that the next year or so. We're looking to migrate to the cloud because it turns out that a single server trying to manage that many devices at Facebook just, it's, it's yeah, it's not a happy place. Um, we had to do a whole bunch of exceptions for the 17. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you guys have in the past. Um, so our, we've got five device services servers that service all of our mobile devices, um, and they are on-prem. So we had to write some paths out and in for APNS to function, obviously, since we need it for mobile device management. And we don't block any of that stuff. It's all wide open. All right, I think, Tom, I saw you had a question. Let's see if I can get it to you. Nice. nice talk. Hi, everybody. I like to talk about mistakes. I would love to, <laughs> if you attended my last talk in this room. Uh, but what I'd love to hear from you guys is talk to me about a time where you made a mistake at work, and it, one, didn't cost you your career, and two, you learned a lot from it. You've got the box. Yeah. I, I, I just keep it. I've, I've never it. made any mistakes that I admit to. <laughs> Oh, man. Where do I start? <laughs> uh, I deleted the monkey repo once. The whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> All of it. So uh, I was testing out a new process to, to auto automatically promote software uh, across 10% of the fleet of time so that we didn't you know, DDoS the entire monkey server all at once when massively numbers of thousands of clients all checked in at the same time. And, uh, the idea was that I would copy the repo to a separate location on the disk, uh, build the catalogs there, and then copy it back. I had a logic error uh, in my code. And also, I was working on a machine. That I had taken it out of the DNS rotation. There were no clients checking into it. It was like the fifth one deep down in a round robin circle. So like it was totally untouched. Nothing was using it. It was using an NFS filer to, to copy the repo, you know, to share it across multiple servers. No one told me it was mounted as read-write, not read-only. Made a logic error in my script, replaced the entire micro with a symlink to itself. <laughs> that then synced across NetApp to all the production servers. Yeah. Someone's like, hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to download Kino. It's not working. I'm like, huh, that's odd. Wait, <laughs> wait, OK, wait. Where are the catalogs? Wait, <laughs> where's the rest of the repo? What was that syncing feeling? <laughs> well played. That's not how I use shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so be careful and test your scripts carefully in non-production environments. Um, the, good, the good news, though, is that I mean it was easy to restore. It was a 45-minute restoration. We have it all backed up in a, in a, in a giant uh, in, in Swift OpenStack database, so it wasn't a huge deal. But I mean it was you know it was an issue. Uh, it highlighted the fact that we don't really we didn't really have a good testing environment at the time. We didn't have a way to effectively take a server out of rotation and test on it without actually affecting production infra. And uh, that was an important lesson learned about, you know, make sure if you're going to test something that could potentially be destructive to a critical infrastructure, that you really, really have a way to sandbox it. So mine's kind of related. Um, so years and years ago, uh, I tried to turn retrospect into something approaching an enterprise class backup system. <laughs> It took a lot of work, and what it involved was having a t it used Retrospect's FTP backup. I don't know if anyone used that, but it like t it took backups and like saved it as as like file chunks. And I thought, well, I've got all these file chunks, so I can sync them to another location, and thus I can achieve offsite backups. So this was our backups for our uh, desktops and laptops at the place I was working at at the time. And I was like, okay, so I've got the solution for syncing them. I've got it set to like sync every like five minutes or so. Uh, this will make sure that everything is perfect and I will never ever lose data. So we had a thunderstorm at our one data center, uh, which happened to hold uh, the primary backup server. 
and uh, my the primary backup server, the disk storage had a uh, small problem, and um, so the the server itself stayed up, but the uh, the storage itself unmounted, but to the syncing software it still looked mounted, and. I had set up the syncing software, of course, because I want an exact copy of what's on production to show up on the offsite. And so it was like, oh, there's nothing there. And now there's nothing there either. <laughs> <laughs> I found out that uh, drive savers, in order to recover uh, extra raids, actually wants you to ship the raids to them. Um, and after a long and uh, torturous series of meetings with my CIO, my CIO finally said, well, wait, what, this was backup data, right? He's, I was like, yes, yeah, it was backup data. He's like, so we didn't actually lose anything unless someone's like drive dies, right? He's like, yeah. He's like, how much do drive savers want? And I told him, he's like, we're just going to restart the backups and we're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> So two weeks later, after uh, some more redundancy was built into the system, everyone, everything was back to normal, and we just we we were very open about it with our with our user community. We just told them, by the way, bad things happen to the desktop backup. So over the next probably like week or so, if you ask us for a restore, you're not going to get one. Uh, but hopefully, after a week or so, we'll be back in business. And sure enough, we were. But that that was uh, seeing that and going, oh yeah, I'll just go to the holy crap. <laughs> So that, that's probably the, uh, the worst mistake that I've ever made in production. And in, in my defense, it was mostly the thunderstorm's fault. <laughs> so if only we could blame all our mistakes on thunderstorms, you know? I, I regularly blame my mistakes on thunderstorms. It's a, it's a good path Clearly to go. Sky's thunderstorms. I've, actually, I've actually got a good one here for this. So I'm, I'm going to chime in on this. Um, I don't want to take too much time. And if you want the full story, it's, uh, I told it last year at XWorld. It's on YouTube. But essentially, I was helping a very large client, I think it was around 60,000 max, migrate from a on-prem uh, Jamf server to Jamf Cloud. And what I decided to do was write my own custom script that would uh, unmanage the machine from the on-prem Jamf server. And then uh, it would try to enroll in the new Jamf server, and it would continue to enroll until it was successful. Uh, Unfortunately, someone didn't get the memo about phasing this rollout, and it went out to all 60,000 machines at once. <laughs> so what, it, what uh, essentially happened was a DDoS attack on Jamf Cloud that I, I had no way of stopping, <laughs> because all the machines got enrolled from the original uh, Jamf server. And th yeah, uh, so that was, that was a fun one. Um, don't do that. Uh, yeah, uh, who else has a question? Oh, who, where's the box? Tom, you got the box? Oh, yeah. We got one all the way in the back there, it looks like. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought I because th we got to Rich, and I just I was I'm in the I'm in the uh, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking literally. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, you're fine. Mine is actually fairly similar to what you just said. Um, so I m had a mobile iron environment at one point, um, and it was on a VM appliance. And when I would update this mobile iron server, I would take a snapshot of said. VM appliance and didn't clean up after myself. So when we went to go enroll about 2,000 sixth graders all at the same time, our entire mobile iron instance crashed for the entire first week of school. Um, and it took me and mobile iron in that entire week to figure out if I just needed to delete my snapshots. <laughs> that was a little embarrassing. Greg, you still haven't made any mistakes. Well, in, in, I actually, in the I, I thought of one. It <laughs> <laughs> Early in the development of uh, Monkey, I got this email from this guy in Finland. And he says, I've written this Objective-C application to be a GUI for your wonderful Monkey program. You should try it out. And so that, that was my bad Finnish accent. Um, <laughs> so I, I download this this piece of code that this person I had never met before on the internet sent to me, and I opened it up and I pointed it at my production monkey repo. <laughs> and um, later, I, I was looking at manifests, you know, it was, it, it's, it's nice, it, it's monkey admin, by the way, the, those of you who know monkey, it was, the, it was the, one of the early beta versions of monkey admin by Hannes Yudelanian. And uh, I'm looking at manifests, I'm looking at package info files. And then the next time I went back and looked at a manifest I was looking at before, and it wasn't there. And 
what I realized is that every single manifest I'd looked at had then been resaved back out as an empty file to my production monkey server. So I was systematically destroying the manifests as I was looking at them. <laughs> Fortunately, there are backups. But uh, the, th the thing to, to learn is don't run code from people on the internet against your production data. You don't, don't, you don't need this. I don't need you that. A mic. I, yeah, I'm special. Uh, OK, so we have a question in the back, yes? Yeah, uh, my question has to do with the D word, which is documentation. Um, and um, that is that is <laughs> <laughs> what my, my my question is actually kind of two part. What do you use recommend for uh, knowledge base and also for uh, run books? Did you say grunt works? Run books. Oh, which this is your favorite topic, isn't it? Yeah, it kind of is. Um, <laughs> So you, for knowledge, so you just want to like know what tools are good for like storing this information or? Yeah, I, have a lot, I work for a school, I'm in K-12. And okay. I've got faculty and staff and students and I've got a lot of people that need to contribute to certain things that are involved in our academic databases, that are involved in some of our communication stuff, our website, some of the other pieces. and. I have to have multiple people be able to access it and create stuff. And then from a tech side of the thing, the run books for us to just document everything to avoid the hit by the bus scenario and not know how anything works. Gotcha. Do you have a budget? Yes. Okay. That's good. Not, not everyone does. Um, I personally like uh, uh, Confluence uh, for this. Confluence is a great wiki solution. Um, it's one of those things where if you didn't have a budget, uh, like MediaWiki might be a good solution. Um, I like a lot of Apple products. Their wiki solution is not one of the ones that I like. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons I like Confluence is simply because it makes it so easy to just drop things in. Uh, you can drop in code. You can drop in uh, you know images really easily. And uh, the main thing there is just um, I would say have someone who is kind of in charge of uh, organization for the wiki. Because um, that's the kind of thing that as multiple people uh, edit it, it can kind of, you know, you might wind up with like multiple pages all covering kind of the same information. So having someone to kind of wrangle it all is a good idea. I don't have any particular product recommendation, but I second the motion of a wiki. Uh, because that way you can write documentation that then somebody who is wrong can come and change everything for you and then you spend the next month fixing it again. Um, <laughs> but the, the important thing about documentation is that uh, you really have to incorporate documentation into your actual workflow. Uh, documentation is useless if nobody reads it, right? So you need to make sure that everybody who might be affected or might benefit from this documentation knows where to find it, has the ability to find it easily, and it's part of the process and to the point where if documentation is not followed or if people are not following the protocol and are making mistakes that are documented already or asking questions that are documented, there needs to be a remediation path to indicate, okay, there actually is an answer to your question already. You could have saved everybody some time if you had searched you know, this place first rather than asking or filing a ticket or any kind of anything like that. So make sure that whatever process you have for documenting and making these run books um, is easily accessible and is publicly accessible to everybody in the company who might who might need it um, and, and just make sure that they all know that they should be searching documentation first before they try to interact with people who might you know before they try to take up someone's time by asking them questions about it so I have to ask do you have a real ticketing system since you're k-12 yeah no we use web help desk for the ticketing system but the knowledge base isn't necessarily what we want it okay. works well with um, the uh, the cat, uh, Jamf, and it works well with the Apple um, self-servicing stuff. How self-reliant are your teachers? <laughs> I, thought, I thought you said you worked in schools. <laughs> this is my 10th year in K-12, so how willing are they to actually read the things that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah that, that's a, it's going to be a uh, as much of a... Uh, a shift in, in regard to actually doing that. Okay. The only thing that I would recommend besides the wiki stuff is I don't have a specific product to recommend to you. I built my own.
because there wasn't anything that I thought was teacher friendly enough yep. to actually get them to read it. Um, because contextual menus are really important when it comes to education people. You need those breadcrumbs. And sometimes with wiki stuff, you'll lose wh what path you took to get there. And so it can make that a little bit difficult. But the first part of it is you have to actually have users who are willing to do it. And if you don't have teachers or students who are willing to help themselves and it's easier for them to send you an email, they will. Sorry. I know it's part of a larger school book. Ah. I don't really have anything to add other than it's a, it's a really hard topic to solve. And I know that we've tried many times and we've tried lots of different products and we're still searching for the best one. It, it's, it's really, it's a difficult, it's difficult to both have something that's easy to record your documentation on and that people will actually be able to find the documentation that you've written. And I don't have a, an answer for that. All right, we've got a couple questions here in the Slack channel. So I'm going to take a quick uh, walk over there. Uh, we have a question here. What backup migration solutions do you all use for your Macs? Are you still, are you all using cloud solutions or on-prem? Our company still uses Time Machine hooked up to external spinning drives for both backups and migrations, and it's painful. It's actually written like that. <laughs> so backups and migrations are two, actually, at least from my perspective, they're two different things. I assume by migration you mean user gets a new machine, how do you migrate their, their data from the old machine to the new machine? I, I suppose one way you could do it would be to restore their, their backup from their old machine to the new machine, but that's usually kind of slow. Um, so we wrote, we, I wrote a, uh, a script that just basically does a, an, uh, an rsync of the, uh, the user's old home folder on their old machine with their new machine. And they can connect the machines via target disk mode or they can connect them via, uh, just put them on the same um, network. They can, they can do it over um, SSH. Um, and I wrote it originally because we had a lot of FileVault encrypted machines, especially FileVault 1, and Apple's migration assistant refused to migrate FileVault 1 home directories. It, it told you that you had to uh, decrypt them first, and we didn't want to do that. But I think if I were completely doing it from scratch today, I might just use migration assistant for that, even though it has its own issues. Um, it's just code I don't have to, to maintain. And for backups, we currently are using CrashPlan to back up our, our Mac um, laptops and desktops. Um, our uh, license renewal is coming up in the fall. We haven't decided whether we're going to renew or not. And I'll let you guess what that means. <laughs> Real quick, uh, we're getting some reports in the Slack channel that the audio in the overflow room is way too loud. If uh, <laughs> someone could help with that, I'm sure the people over there would be very appreciative. <laughs> Should I talk softly? No. OK. Um, so we don't back up any of our users' desktops data um, or laptops at all. So we encourage them to use their Google Drives and or their network attached storage. And if they do not, they lose their things. <laughs> Seconded. No, absolutely. Wow, uh, people in here. Same for us as well. Um, I mean, we're a software company, and therefore all the important work should be saved in source control. Um, anything that you're working on, any projects, should be saved in the company managed source control repos. Um, anything beyond that uh, should be, you know, Dropbox, you know, like things like that. There are company approved storage solutions that are, you know, cloud storage. Um, the laptop itself is essentially expendable. Uh, they're, they're terminals, they're, they're ways to access data. Nearly all of uh, Facebook's development environment is not actually on the laptop itself, it's in external servers or data centers and things like that. So the laptop is merely a means to an end. Um, we just happen to find that you know the Macs make good development environments, so that's why we we offer them out. But ultimately, whatever you store on there, it's up to you. We actually we actively discourage uh, time machine backups, things like that. We don't want copies of corporate data on unencrypted external drives wandering around, right? It's just it's it's just not a good idea for us. So uh, we discourage personal backups. We discourage iCloud. We discourage a lot of things. We encourage you to keep your important data in the places the company provides specifically for that purpose. Um, anything beyond that if, uh, for migrations? I mean, you know, just like uh, just like Greg said, migration assistant is, is the devil. Uh, it should be avoided <laughs> at all costs. Just don't do it. Um, R-Sync is, is a much more effective tool. And kind of wrapping your own little uh, 
personal scripts that does the things you need to do before, during, and after migration is generally going to be more effective in most cases. Um, plug it in with you know a Thunderbolt cable and run your rsync script, and users generally have a better experience that way. But uh, if your machine gets hit by a meteor and all that data is gone, oh well. Yeah, I would also concur with the idea of uh, encourage folks to put it in whatever cloud solution you have. I know a lot of schools are using Google Drive. Um, a lot of corporations are starting to use uh, Microsoft's OneDrive. There's Dropbox for Business. There's, there's all sorts of solutions that'll let you uh, put gigs and gigs or terabytes and terabytes uh, of your data up in the cloud. And I would say if you, I would do two things. One, um, don't have tiny mail quotas so that people can store all their email up on the mail server and to give them access to uh, a solution that lets them basically put their stuff there, it gets synced up without them having to do anything up to a cloud solution or an on-prem solution if you have different security needs and just tell folks if it's not on, if it's not in this you know, one sync folder or if it's not up on the server or it's not in your email, then it's expendable. And that way you give people clear guidance on what they can do to preserve their data and at the same time you save yourself from you know someone showing up at 4 30 on a friday with you know their hard drive with their laptop going it's all dead please and then your weekend is shot so make it easy on yourself make it at least kind of easy on your users and just give them avenues that don't require a lot of work on your part to the documentation one, but it's a more of a larger offshoot off of that. Um, because we have the same problem where we're starting to develop a lot of the documentation, but getting people to go look at it is near impossible. What is some of the best results? That, so we also automate our back end as much as possible to offload work, but what's the best result any of you have ever done to offset work from you onto the user? So any tricks or things that you instituted in your process that just helped make it so much more that they were able to accomplish something before even coming to you? Um, one strategy that uh, we've been using is basically make it easy for uh, your customers to find the documentation that, that solves their problem. Have documentation that solves their problem and make it as explicit as at the top of the documentation. Have a question saying, like for example, um, I'm seeing this message appear. What do I do to fix it? And after that, just have a short answer saying basically, this is caused by X, here's what you do to fix it. Don't necessarily go into a lot of detail on the why it happened. You can, if you want to do that, save that for a section after the solution where you can explain further if the user wants to get further education on the problem, but just have short, pointed, clear documentation on how to fix my specific problem and then make that documentation really easy to find. Uh, one company that does a really good job of that is uh, Dropbox. I, whenever I've had a problem, I've always gone to Dropbox's website. I've been able to clearly and easily find uh, a solution to the problem that I'm seeing. And they just make it really easy to access that documentation. One of the most important things for getting this stuff across is communication, uh, proactive communication especially. Um, a lot of questions that we get usually are a result of a change that we've made at some point. Um, and we find more and more that, especially as we work on things, you know, kind of in the background that users don't necessarily see, um, it may have effects that users do see that we don't anticipate. And, you know, despite we pretend we know everything, um, in an environment as, you know, like, like Facebook's, we just don't, right? There's so many different edge cases. Every single one of those laptops is its own edge case that somebody could have done something different that we didn't expect that could have an interaction we just didn't understand. And so we just can't predict everything that we're gonna do to these machines. We can't predict all the things that might happen. And so the best way to encourage users to be more uh, responsive is just to communicate ahead of time saying, hey, we're making a change. Um, we think it's gonna be fine. And it probably will be for almost everybody. Uh, if it's not, if you, ha if you see something weird, you know, let us know, right? Come contact the, the help desk, the, you know, the, whatever the standard help ticketing system is. You know, make sure it's, there's an easy way for uh, mm -hmm. people to, to say, hey, you know, I noticed you guys said recently that you're making this change. I have this problem going on. Is that related? And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But at least that way they feel like you're recognizing that you know, things that we do could have unintended consequences. Um, and we find that kind of proactive uh, communication ahead of time, before, during, and after changes, 
really, really helps drive users to look for solutions and also be aware that you know, to be mindful of things that happen rather than just get fatigued by dialog boxes they don't understand, which is a real risk, especially with Macs. We do something similar. Um, anytime we have any kind of a big change, we send out emails and push notifications. <coughs> so if you guys are taking advantage of your MDMs being able to send out those push notifications, it's a really good way to get your users to actually pay attention, especially if they're not super great at timely checking their email. Something that pops up and that they physically have to touch to get rid of is going to get their attention a lot better than an actual email. Um, we are also, we polled our technicians this summer as to what the top three issues that they, off, that they get over and over and over again. And we're putting those questions, hey, I'm seeing this, blah, blah, blah. How do I fix it? This is how you fix it on posters. And we're putting them all over the schools. So they're going to physically be walking past them on a regular basis. So hopefully they'll absorb it as they go by. That, that is brilliant. <laughs> I just want to take this a slightly different direction. We use um, Monkey, and we put a lot of software in the optional installs in Managed Software Center so that users can discover and install it for themselves. And there's also help resources in the sidebar. And the challenge that I see is a user doesn't necessarily know to look at uh, in, inside the Managed Software Center for something. And they call our help desk and they say, hey, I, I need Do Adobe Photoshop, let's say. And the help desk person wants to be very helpful and very responsive. So they go, okay, I've added it to your manifest, just uh, it'll, it'll install by itself in a few minutes. Instead of telling the user, hey, you could find it yourself, and, you know, and teaching that user to, to, to fish so that way they don't call them the next time. And I think it's a kind of a natural human instinct, at least for our help desk people, that they, they, you know, they want to be seen as useful, helpful people to their user base. And so that's the challenge for me is getting, is I've, I've, we've developed all this self-help resources, but yet we're not using them to their, their full, uh, full capabilities. All right, we've got some more questions here from the Slack channel. Uh, this question is from Elliot Jordan. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, it's often useful to show decision makers graphs or metrics. What metrics do you track for your teams and how do you display them in a useful and actionable way? I don't. <laughs> um, it depends on what he means by that. Uh, we have a, AirWatch has a dashboard that's built into it, so I can use it to show people things. Um, we make lots and lots of charts because we have lots and lots of data. So it's a question of, that's, that's a little bit of a broad question. I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, but if I'm making, if I'm making like flow charts and stuff like that, I use Visio. We have lots of data. Lots and lots and lots of data. Enough that, you know, when we, uh, we, we look at our, all the data coming from our laptops and we compare that to actual Facebook.com data and, and we just sort of sit there crying a little bit. Um, the, you know, data, collecting data is a great way to kind of identify trends across the fleet. Um, and if nothing else, something as simple as like using, you know, a company like Splunk, log aggregation tools to collect the logs from your clients for things that you care about, whether it's monkey logs or, you know, JSS logs, anything that you do to the machine that produces some kind of output, um, it's probably worth putting that somewhere because even if you don't have any immediate use for that data, it's going to be super helpful if you ever do have an emergency or a situation where you actually have to go back in time and find out what happened to this machine at this time. Maybe for legal reasons, maybe because you have, you know, a, a data emergency or, you know, you have an issue of a vulnerability or security alert, that kind of thing. Having that data just available to use um, is helpful and uh, I recommend highly looking into options for gathering the kind of data you're looking for, even if it's just syslogs from all the machines or monkey logs, like I said, and finding a meaningful way to turn that to something you actually just you know, want to use. What's, what are people actually installing right now? What's the most common popular software in my repo? What are the buttons that people are pressing? Can I record that kind of data? Because you, you, you never know what kind of actual useful information you'll get out of identifying these trends. And the new big term right now is machine learning, right? It's, it's the current uh, industry buzzword for identifying patterns across lots of different uh, models of behavior. And uh, it is a buzzword, but it's also a really fun tool to sort of figure out what data you don't know. Um, it's, it's a helpful way to sort of look at the aggregate patterns of your user's behavior and see things you might not have identified just by watching. And so um, I don't know if this is quite related to Elliot's question, but I just recommend in general, collect data 
put it somewhere, figure out a use for it later, but collect first, because you can't make patterns out of data you don't have. Uh, to go along with Nick's point about collecting data, uh, we literally built an app for that. Um, we, uh, at SAP, we have a, a web app platform called uh, Fiori, and uh, we built a Fiori web app that talks to our uh, Jamf Pro server and pulls out all sorts of interesting information. How many machines have been migrated to Sierra? Uh, what versions of Office 2016 are we currently running? Puts it all into uh, pie charts, what, you know, and that's the kind of thing that we can show live to people. Um, if someone's like, well, how many machines do we currently have on Sierra? Oh, let me look. Out of our 12,000 uh, in change fleet, 11,000 in change are currently running Sierra. Uh, drill down, oh yeah, the most of them are, most of like our remaining 1010 10 machines, they are for whatever reason seemingly in, uh, you know, in China and Japan for whatever reason. So let's talk to the field service coordinators to get those folks moved up to Sierra. We were able to use our Jamf Pro server uh, to quickly pull out that information in certain categories and we were able to then show that to managers uh, because managers love a pie chart um, to say here's what we're doing here's how we're accomplishing our goals here's how we're moving forward here's where we want to be and just building that one app to pull out that information in those certain predetermined categories made a ton of difference So secrets management. Yeah. We're small enough that until recently we wrote them in a book that we put in a lockbox that we had a combination to. I mean, we, the team was small enough and all sitting in one spot. We didn't need anything fancy like a, a web something or another. But we're, we're, we're playing around with Vault, HashiCorp's Vault, as a, a, play, a, a secure place to store that. And I know, I know there, there was some talk of using, um, was it LastPass for Teams or something like that, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a chicken and egg thing, which is if you're securely storing the secret somewhere, where, how do you securely store the secret to access the, the other secrets, right? Um, and the lockbox, you know, we've just walked around and told each other the, the password or the, you know, the code to get into the lockbox, and I keep forgetting it because I never, you know, I don't use it that often. Um, but yeah, I, I would look at something like Vault from, from HashiCorp. I, uh, there's probably some commercial alternatives at Vault is freeware, or shareware, I mean, boy, I seem old. Um, open source, yes, no? Vault, it's pay, pay, pay money? I don't remember. Okay, all right, what are you guys using? Um, so the first thing, you were talking about certificates and stuff like that, so if you're talking about like APNS certificates and being able to log into that APNS um, account, it should never be attached to an individual person anyway. Um, Apple doesn't like this, but if you, it, it needs it to be more, generic. It, it was more like the privacy key generated. Right. Which ah. Is kind of secret. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, if you were talking APNS, I would highly recommend begging Apple Enterprise Support to transfer it to a not specific person, Apple ID. Um, but as far as passwords and stuff are concerned, we have a secret place inside of our um, AD infrastructure that we keep a lot of that information. Um, so if I get hit by a bus, um, my colleagues can access it. And I try and cram as much information out of my brain into my subordinate AirWatch admins' brains um, so that they could take over were I to be hit by a bus. 100% uh, along with that. Um, whatever you do, you do something. Um, you can put passwords on Post-it notes. You can't put certificates easily on Post-it <laughs> notes, right, on a monitor. Um, but you know, use some secrets management tool. But not only that, document how to actually use it so that even if you're the only person who sets up the secret, someone else, if you get hit by a bus, can actually open the secrets vault up and take stuff out of it. Um, make sure that multiple people have access. It's not tied to any one person. Nothing should be individual, right? Something should always be controlled by the company in some, in some way and uh, document the process for doing it. Make sure that people know where to find it. Keep it secure, keep it safe. Um, keep it away from individuals. Uh, make sure it's redundant. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways to share passwords. One password, you know, uh, LastPass, there's all kinds of vendors that'll do that. 
Vault is a great way to share secrets management because that allows you to upload things like certificates and keys and things like that. Find something. Um, something is always better than nothing, no matter what it is. Even if you don't like it that much, having something that you don't like is better than having nothing that you don't like and then having nothing at all if something goes wrong. Um, and make sure you have you know, a, a redundancy strategy, right? You know, in case something does go wrong or what happens if it gets compromised, what's your solution for that? And along with that, have two-factor authentication on everything. Like, like put, put these important secrets behind two-factor, um, especially if it's, and make sure it's not tied to someone's phone, right? So for a long time at my previous job, uh, back when Apple's de uh, device enrollment portal required you to have two-step verification, um, you had to put an a phone number to get access to the debt portal. And I was the only person doing it, so it was my personal phone number. And I was in the basement, so every time I had to log into Depp, I had to walk up two floors to go outside of the street <laughs> to get a text message, then walk back down and put it in before the, text before the code expired. Let me, let me tell you how much fun that was. But no, that's exactly the kind of thing where you want to avoid, right? You don't want to have one person's personal phone number be like the sole way to get into critical infrastructure. Um, make a Google Voice number, find, you know, fake it out, find something, but don't tie it to individuals, put it behind two-fac, and document the process. Make sure that somebody else can do it in case you're gone or hit by a bus or win the lottery. Or hit by the lottery bus. Yeah, lottery bus. Hit by the lottery bus is my new uh, go-to for that. You know, it's, it sounds less grim and it sounds more happy. Um, yeah, we we also have an internal uh, secrets management tool uh, in my shop. Um, my one regret about it is that it does not handle actually storing files within it. It just handles passwords. Um, but what I've been doing is using encrypted disk images and storing the password for, to unlock that encrypted disk image in our secrets management tool. So in that case, you've got your encrypted disk image, um, which uses great, you know, if you're using Apple's disk utility tool to do it, you know, just set it for at the strongest encryption that it, you can set it for, set a nice strong password on it, and uh, at, at, that, <laughs> at that point, you can put that almost, you know, if you want to link it to your wiki at that point, it's, it's just as secure there because it's an encrypted file. Um, and that way, you can include that as part of your documentation to say, okay, you know, to do this, the first thing you need to do, download this file, then go into your secrets management to find the password to unlock it. And at that point, you open it up, that's where your certificates are, that's where your, uh, your private keys are. And that way, you can manage that in both a secure and convenient fashion. Another good option is uh, one password for Teams which is what we're using at Fastly uh, in the IT department. Yeah, it, co it costs money, but it's, it works. Um, so we've got uh, three questions in Slack that are all kind of related and chained off of each other, so this is gonna be a, a bit of a doozy, so bear with me here. Um, first part of the question is, DEP is great for one-to-one -one deployments, but there's still a need to wipe and reload labs in bulk. With APFS looming, how are you reloading labs and how are you future-proofing your workflows? Uh, piggybacking off of that, um, uh, with the changes to, on the horizon to Mac management, what do you feel about the future of Mac management? Um, like DEP and MDM versus imaging, background daemons, entitlements, APFS, ARM, Macs, et cetera. Um, and then we also have... <laughs> There's a whole session right there. Yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the and then we future. also have uh, um, how are companies like Facebook and Disney doing things for initial setup of a machine? Um, you know, Jam from Airwatch are great with DEP, but how, um, how's Facebook and Disney getting Monkey or Chef on the machines? Uh, are you guys imaging? So. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a, that's a really big I'm, I'm broad I'm just going to say that's a lot. Uh, so I'm going to take it kind of in a reverse order. How are we handling uh, uh, setting up new machines? Um, we actually wrote our own application called Refresh for this. And it works by uh, plugging. Um, basically, you need kind of a host machine because it's doing it over Thunderbolt. So the machine you want to set up, you boot it into target disk mode. You hook it up to uh, a machine that's running the refresh application and you basically select, do I want to wipe this machine or do I want to set up a machine that has an existing OS from Apple? So in other words, does the machine you're connecting to, did it just come out of the box and you just need to set it up? And refresh will be able to handle both situations of do I need to wipe it and then put my stuff over or do I need to just put my stuff over? And in both cases, that's been a good solution for our techs because it's just, you know, they just need to round up uh, another machine um, to run the refresh application on, and that's generally been about it. 
what was the middle question? It was about the future, and there was a whole bunch of stuff. And <laughs> there was there was ARM in there at one point. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what half these acronyms are. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just put that under the category of always in motion is the fu in the future. Ask me next year. Um, I, I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm terrible at predicting the future. And with regards to APFS and imaging with APFS, I'm just going to put that under the category of NDA. <laughs> Uh, if, if, if anyone was in uh, the session previously next door, you got to hear me cite the NDA a lot because honestly, this is stuff that Apple hasn't publicly commented on yet themselves. So maybe a simpler question that also has popped up in, in Slack here is, is imaging dead? <laughs> Will imaging be dead? Will imaging be dead? Well, in the year 2525, uh, does man still thrive or whatever the heck the song is? Um, ask me in late September. That's, that's the best I can say. Because at, at the moment, it's either NDA or it's just unknown. I'm excited by this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> keep doing what you're doing until you can't, right? Because you don't have much of a choice, right? So, so we don't know if Apple's going to break everything that we've been doing uh, come September. All we can do right now is test the betas. If you're not, a, if you're not already a developer who has access to the betas, um, that should be your first step, right? <coughs> Get access to the betas, test your environment. You don't want surprises when it comes out publicly and all your users download it and you find out you can't deploy machines anymore. So test now before you find out and, uh, and you don't want to. But um, as of this moment, I mean, we have to go through hundreds of machines every week. We have to crank through hundreds, and uh, we're in more countries than DEP is supported in. And so I really can't rely on something like DEP to be the universal solution for all of our needs. It just doesn't match our environment. It just doesn't at all. And we all have cases where we have to be able to provision machines that have no internet access ever in their entire lifetime. They're in a data center somewhere. And so again, DEP doesn't make sense in that environment, nor does MDM. I can't rely on push notifications for machines that don't ever talk to the internet. So we want to try and keep everything within our walls at Facebook. Everything should be able to be done on premises without dependency on external forces as best we can. Um, up until the point where Apple makes that impossible, we're going to keep doing it that way. And I will say, mm -hmm. all I can say is that so far it's been working fine. Um, and the testing I've done with 1013 has not been disastrous. So I would encourage you to do the same. Test your environment. Whatever you do right now, make sure it's still going to be the same in a couple months. Now, Right now, beta is still very much a beta, right? So take whatever your results are with several grains of salt, and also remember that Apple is going to change things often a lot between one version of the beta and the next. 10, you know, 10.13.3 and 10.13.4 could have completely different interactions. So you really got to test again and again and again to get all those answers in. But um, imaging still seems to be a valid strategy as far as I can tell, and it's still, for us, the most effective and fastest way to crank through the volume of machines that we have to get through every week. Um, and, you know, Apple has promised that they will be seeing an expansion of DEP support around the world. Uh, more countries will be added, you know, every so often. But uh, we're still in more countries than Apple supports step in. And there's really no way around that for us. So I just, I can't rely on that tool. So imaging is dead <laughs> um, <laughs> in my environment. <laughs> so we haven't imaged a single Mac since 2014. Um, we do not image things. We start everything from blank and we def and roll it. Whether it's in a lab or it belongs to an individual person, there are two different def enrollment profiles depending on whether it's a shared device or a person specific device. The lab Macs are all shared devices so that they can have multiple users logging into them versus a file fault protected individual person's device. So we deploy all of our software and all of our configurations from AirWatch. Um, AirWatch is what joins our computers to our domain. It puts down all of the wireless profiles. It configures everything. So it's not something that a technician has to directly touch unless it, if it's changing hands, they wipe it with a flash drive that just has the blank operating system on it. But I'm not sure if that counts as imaging, really, because I don't have an imaging server. I turned it off in 2014. <laughs> So it's, it's just not something we do. We pull them out of the box and we set them up the way they are. And that's how they move forward to the people they belong to. So I think a, a question that, that someone's probably asking in their head right now is, 
um, doing the, the USB drive uh, refresh of the OS is, is great for one-offs, but how do you handle an entire lab? Do you just walk around with that USB drive to each, <coughs> each machine? Um, it depends on the technician. Um, most of them have multiples, and okay. they just, and they don't wipe those labs very often because the software on them doesn't change that often because textbooks don't change that often. So you actually have to have a textbook that matches the software to be able to update something. Um, so for example, a lot of schools, it takes them a long time to switch versions of Office because those textbooks have to catch up. And so you have to be compliant with the textbook and with the curriculum before you can update that stuff. So it's only every several years that that kind of stuff has to be wiped out and redone. So they'll go through and they'll clean up user accounts. <coughs> Um, but those labs do not get wiped frequently. I have two bits of advice. Um, the first one would be you need to have multiple ways to set up a machine. When we get a new machine in, I can netboot it and image it. I could netboot it and just install some enrollment packages. I could even boot it from the recovery partition and use a USB drive to to install some enrollment packages. All of those will work. Some are faster than others. But if Apple takes away one of those methods, now I still have some other methods to work on. So if whatever deployment method you're using can't be adapted to multiple, maybe you should work on that. That will give you more flexibility in the future depending on what, what Apple does. The other bit of advice is, uh, does everybody know who Mike Bombich is? He, he, he's the author of Carbon Copy Cloner and he did the original yeah. Net Restore. Um, he wrote a blog post uh, yesterday, I think it was, recommending that, and I, I'm not recommending this, but just something to think about, recommending that we don't, that people don't convert their, their um, machines to APFS when they install High Sierra. And that may be controversial, but if you think about it, if you're worried that imaging is going away with APFS, well, we could buy ourselves another year of, of reprieve to get ready for that or to adapt to that by not going to APFS because imaging still works with, we know it works with HFS plus and 1013 will run on HFS plus so that might be an option for you is to keep your machines on HFS plus for another year while you figure out what you're going to do after that. So we have another question in the room? Yeah. Nice and close, I like it. Mine should be short and sweet. It's a personal preference question regarding documentation and when. Now that this Mac OS has all the parts and the and all that, I think all my documentation is in the Now going forward, how do you write? Two people with So I don't work for Apple, so I don't care what they say. <laughs> you know, they, they probably have a consistent communication, this is the way you must always do it. Just whatever works for you and your users. I, I don't think that that's, you know, the way you spell Mac OS, are your users actually going to be confused? Do you think? Probably not, right? Yeah. You could say... Are they? Are they really going to be confused by that? Do they even know what an OS is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kind of in the same boat as him. Uh, I tend to say Mac OS because it's got the word Mac in it, um, and it differentiates it from being iOS. So granted, I also don't have anything older than Yosemite running in my environment. So at that point, Apple's kind of referring to that as Mac OS at this point, so I just call everything Mac OS because it's less confusing. We purged all the old software. I now go into a flying rage if I see anything on 10, 11, or lower. <laughs> so I don't have this problem anymore. Um, that being said, I'm also really neurotic about my documentation. And I actually went back and changed a whole bunch of mine to match the current style. So I'm a really terrible example of, of, of how to deal with the situation. I tried to stick with whatever the name that Apple tagged it with. So if it's 10.7 uh, or earlier, back to uh, back when it was Mac space OS. Uh, I just call that Mac OS 10. And then, <laughs> and apparently that's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> <laughs>
but for Mountain Lion uh, through um, El Capitan, I just call it OS 10, and then for Sierra and High Sierra, I'm just sticking with Mac OS, all one word, where the Mac is lowercase. I'm just, you know, if nothing else, it'll match hopefully other documentation, even though I noticed that Apple is now trying to go back in their own documentation and just relabel everything Mac OS, which is annoying. Um, but that's how I do it. I'm not going to tell anybody that how they're doing it is wrong unless they start labeling it like Windows or Solaris or something like that. So another question we had from the, the Slack channel, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm in the back of the room at the moment. Um, thank you. Is uh, what, uh, what are your opinions on uh, our careers as Mac admins? What should we stop doing? What should we continue doing? What should we start doing? Um, that, that, that is a tough one because that can be very individual. Uh, I will say that this is probably, there has never been a better time to be a Mac admin because the job market, I don't think has, I don't think I've ever seen it as good as it is now. Uh, I got started at the precise wrong time to go into Mac IT, uh, because I started in, uh, 1999, 2000, um, back when I was getting well-meaning talks from relatives and friends going, are you sure you really want to do this? <laughs> and I said, yes, because I don't want to do Windows. And uh, every year it was like, is, is my platform going to stay around? Until all of a sudden it turned into, not only is my platform staying around, all of a sudden it's cool. You know? um, and Apple turned into this enormous mega corporation kind of on the, on the back of the iPhone, and uh, all of a sudden it would turn from, is Apple going to go bankrupt, to how much money is Apple putting into its Scrooge McDuck money bin, you know? <laughs> so I, I don't know about what other folks are you know, planning to do. My opinion is basically that this, there has never been a better time to go into this field. And I'm happy that it evolved this way, because maybe, just maybe, it'll stay that way until I retire. <laughs> Here's hope. You're here. Um, the one thing I'll say on that is that uh, I would generally discourage anybody from tying their entire career to a single vendor. Um, everything that we do, all the things that we do in all the sessions here, I mean, there have been, the, the PSU has had a huge variety of topics on everything from Wi Fi to leadership training to managing teams to communication to actual technical Mac things, right? And so, all of these things that we're doing here involve us learning a multitude of skills. And everything that we do in our careers, in my opinion, should be about learning large sets of skills that can be applied to many situations. So even though a lot of us spend a lot of time developing open source tools that are meant to help Macs do things that we want, you know, Monkey is a Mac management tool to get packages onto Macs. It's probably not applicable to most other people outside the Mac admin community. But the skills that are involved in managing Monkey, understanding the organization of data, understanding how to read files to figure out what they do, how to understand the flow of code, programming skills, are all things that can be applied to a lot of things. And so even if one day, God forbid, you know, Apple does go belly up, we can take our skills and do something else with it, right? So I would just encourage everybody to, to, as you work, no matter what you do, find ways to generalize what you're doing. Um, one thing I really like with the open source community is that when you write tools that you know you're going to release to the public, the, the way that you think about solving the problem kind of shifts a bit. It's less about what am I going to do to solve my problem to how am I going to solve several problems I might have in the future. And just that kind of thinking alone gives you the flexibility to take on any kind of new situation. So I don't know what's going to happen to Apple. They have a giant bucket of money hiding under their campus somewhere that you know the top programmers get to go swim in every once in a while. And <laughs> right, so, so the likelihood of Apple disappearing anytime soon is probably pretty low for, you know, I think everybody here is pretty confident in that. But regardless, all the skills that we develop at conferences like these can be used in so many different ways. Um, and so depending on any one vendor to be your lifeblood, it's always, you know, to me, it seems like a, a scary proposition. I'm with Nick on that because education can swing really fast depending on what's cool for learning at any given time. So because it's so variable, I've only been a Mac admin for three years. I was, a, I was an Active Directory domain admin before I did this, and 
I did app deployment with Case, and I mean, before that I did Novell. Um, so it, it's something that tying yourself to a specific vendor or tying yourself to a specific operating system or specific device, chain of devices, is bad for your career. Um, it's not something that will help you move forward in the future because you always have to be prepared for that massive change. Because just if Apple doesn't go belly up, which I highly doubt they will, that doesn't mean that your company won't change and eradicate all of its Macs. And if you want to keep working for that company, you need to change with it. So it's really a question of how much are you wanting to not learn new things? You gotta learn new things to stay current. And tying yourself to just Mac stuff, not really learning everything you can. Ditto. Uh, yeah, don't, don't tie yourself to, to the, the Mac. Don't tie yourself to Apple. Uh, I'm not concerned about Apple going belly up. I am concerned about the Mac becoming a very uninteresting platform to manage. That things, that Apple will continue to lock things down to the point that there really won't be much for you to do. So therefore, you should be learning to do things outside of that, that realm. And if that means learning how to write web apps, to code in Python, uh, to, to manage a, a Linux server, Linux boxes, learning Puppet, learning Chef, learning Ruby, uh, anything that you could probably use today to help you do your job today, but that you could transfer those skills on to some other thing that you might be doing in the future. Do you have anyone in the room? So do any of you guys have a piece of software or web service or even some hardware, anything, that you use once in a while, uh, but you really, really love it and you'd like to recommend it to other people? I like GitHub. <laughs> I feel like if I loved it, I wouldn't just use it every once in a while. So I'm not really sure how to answer that question. I'm going to partially ignore the once in a while part and just say that uh, everybody has opinions about their best, you know, IDE, their best development environment. You know, everyone likes Sublime Text or Atom or you know whatever your text, you know, text, whatever your editor is. Um, I have my own preferences, which probably aren't the same as everybody else's preferences on this panel. Um, and I will say, like, find the one that you really like and uh, use it more than once in a while. Use it a lot. Find the things that you like and use them often, and then figure out how to also make them more, uh, more general, right? One of the things I, I try to make an effort to do is make sure that whatever I do to set up my personal you know, testing and working environment on my machine, if I ever have to transfer to a new machine, I want to bring that with me. I don't want to have to recreate all my steps over and over again every time I get a new machine. So find a way to recreate your process. Save that in Dropbox. Save it to GitHub. Save, save your special software the way that you like. Can put that in some configuration somewhere that you can, re that you can reproduce. Because um, I want to have that everywhere with me, everywhere, everywhere I go. I want to have my Vim settings transfer with me. I want to have ZSH come with me, no matter what server I'm on. And uh, there are lots of tools out there for getting that kind of thing. Uh, to work better for you. So find a tool you love, stick with it, and uh, generalize it. Use it everywhere. Yeah, I would agree with what uh, Nick said. And honestly, some of my favorite tools are the ones that are running all the time without me having to tell them what to do. Um, <laughs> but, and and a, a good example of this is uh, I use CrashPlan personally for my backup stuff. I so rarely open CrashPlan I so rarely interact with CrashPlan. I check CrashPlan every once in a while to make sure that it's backing up my stuff, you know, just make sure, glance up to the menu bar to uh, make sure I've got a little checkbox showing there to show that all my stuff is backed up. Do I use CrashPlan from a I'm in it all the time thing? No, I don't. Do I love CrashPlan? Yes, I do. <laughs> because it will save my butt. I right, got another one from Slack. This was addressed specifically to Michelle, but I'm actually interested to hear what everyone's thoughts are on this since you're all from such different environments. Um, have you ever had to justify the higher cost for Apple products versus anything else? Do you ever get pushback? Okay, so this is actually kind of a, it, this is a sore spot for me because Chromebooks are becoming so popular in education, but dollar for dollar, they aren't more they aren't less expensive. Apple products are not more expensive. They are a more expensive upfront cost, or they used to be, 
now on Apple iPad is 300 bucks. Um, and so for us, the management licenses for AirWatch are cheaper than buying a management license for Google because it's $30 and you can't reuse it. It dies with the Chromebook. Um, and so if that Chromebook breaks, if a student drops it, you have to buy another $30 license just to get another Chromebook into your environment to replace that Chromebook that broke. And our life cycle for replacing iPads is on a five year, four to five year scale. We would have to buy a pretty expensive Chromebook to make it future compatible enough to be able to last that long. So the new Chromebooks that are touch or they can run the, uh, the App Store, the Google Play Store, they're like $450. And all of the content creation software for making movies, um, doing music editing, it's not free. It's a subscription per user. We've got 25,000 students. That would be really expensive to pay $10 a year per user. I'm sure there's some kind of bulk discount, but I'm sure it's not as cheap as iMovie that comes with an iPad that they all already know how to use. So it's a real question of it's not higher costs the way that people think that it is, especially with the pricing change that's happened recently. But it still has that stigma attached to it that Apple is fancy and Apple is expensive. Um, but our breakage rate on our iPads is 2%. And they're two years old. So, I mean, that's pretty amazing to me because the iPad 2s were not nearly that durable. We broke 150 of them a week. Um, but our iPad Air 2s is 150 a month, if that, and it's great. So, I mean, the, I, I feel like there's a really unfair and aggressive push against school districts who are choosing Apple products because to their parents and to their community and to their taxpayers, it seems like they're wasting money on this more expensive product. But in reality, it actually ends up being either the same price or less expensive than going with a different product because you don't have to pay for all of those subscription softwares. All of the tools for content creation are already built in. There's already a forward-facing camera. There's already touch there. The only difference is an iPad doesn't have a keyboard attached to it. Sure. We don't have to justify the, the, the additional cost of Apple products. Um, I guarantee, I'm not going to, say exact numbers, but the Linux hardware that our animators use is way more expensive than the most expensive product Apple sells. So Apple stuff is a bargain in comparison. Uh, I work for Money Tree, so I can't answer that question very effectively <laughs> either. Um, I will say, though, that uh, if you ask that question just about every one of the vendors out in the hall, I'm sure every single one of them probably has either like a, a sheet or a pamphlet prepared or a webinar about why Macs in your business environment make sense. Um, I think I know, I think Jamf did one recently, and I think they have a webinar you can look online for about why Macs in an organization, in an enterprise, make sense and is an effective choice. Um, watch all of them, look at all of them, re ask all the vendors the same questions, and you'll get a lot of good answers for why Macs really actually aren't very expensive. And um, if you're looking for ammunition to use in a meeting with your, you know, with the people who manage money organization to, to justify the cost of that, I'm sure that between all these different vendors, you can come up with a list that makes sense in your environment of why, you know, this will work. Um, so seriously, ask, ask the vendors who are good at this. Yeah, we're, I'm in, my shop's in kind of a similar situation where we, we make a lot of money, so we're very focused on employee choice. And also we buy enough in quantity of just about anything that we can get some pretty good discounts on whatever it is. Um, so I'm actually gonna go back a little bit to my previous workplaces where I was supporting uh, scientists doing medical research. And for them, uh, they made the choices that uh, they were willing to put whatever it cost to get max because Max, from their point of view, help them do their work better. And it's hard to put a price on that. I mean, I, I know some organizations try, but from the medical research point of view, my scientists were basically like, they were told, whatever you need to get your job done, we're not gonna stand in your way. A lot of them bought Max because that's how they worked best. And the money was a secondary consideration. 
And I was just going to add, because I've, well, first of all, um, if it's good enough for IBM, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but if, if the, particularly the JAMP, uh, JNOC presentation that IBM did in October of 2016, where they actually broke down numbers, is something you should all look at if that's a question you're dealing with. But let's take a step back. A lot of times when you're dealing with people, people are getting paid, professionals using Macs, it was different than academic environment, people are getting paid relatively high salaries. You know, what's the, what's the cost, acquisition cost delta for a Mac? Is it, let's say it's a thousand bucks, okay? For a machine somebody, you're paying, you know, high five or six figure salary to, you're gonna pay a thousand dollars more and that machine's gonna be there for at least three years. That's 333 bucks a year. Are you gonna get anal about that? Because you're really looking at the wrong things. All right, do we have a, uh, we have a four minutes left. Do we have a really quick question? Anybody in the? We got one right here. You got the last question. Uh, if you guys could limit your, try to limit your uh, answers to like 45 seconds each, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so we'll see if that's quick. Uh, what about code signing? If you're creating a custom package, whether it's in packages or a monkey package, how do you decide what to sign or what not to sign? And if it's a vendor or a third party and you have to repackage it, should you sign it? Yes, sign it. No, don't sign it. <laughs> I don't use any of those tools. No, don't sign it. We win! All right. <laughs> I, I meant 45 seconds each, but that was great. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I, I want to thank uh, the panel for sitting in and answering the questions. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you all for coming, asking questions. Uh, it was great. Thank you for, for Penn State for letting us uh, do this. <laughs> we do have uh, we, we have one final question we got from Twitter, and then, uh, and then we'll wrap this up. And the final question is uh, from Adam Kodega. Is pineapple a valid topping on pizza? Only on pizza. No, never, ever. It's gross. <laughs> Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Don't tie your pizza to any one flavor. <laughs> it's bad for your career. Good answer, good answer. <laughs>